I swear I try to keep these devlogs down to a single topic, but this one's just a mess. You'll have to bear with me a little bit. It all started with me reworking how player movement was interpolated for other players. Before there was a bunch of rubber banding, so I changed it to be a little more smooth. It's not perfect, but it's good enough for a prototype. My objective at this point in the game's development is to make a fun online prototype with minimal polish. Then from there I want to rework the game into something more finished by adding a bunch of content. But for now I'm mostly just focused on the core game loop, dungeon crawling. I figured an easy step in that direction would be to make a sort of one room dungeon where the player would walk into the room, start the encounter, and battle it out, either dying or defeating all the monsters in the room. The default state of the room is to have a destructible crystal in the middle. Once destroyed, I spawn some doors to close the room. These also look like crystals because I'm apparently too lazy to draw a gate. Next I start spawning waves. To get to the next wave, the player just needs to kill all the monsters in the room. And once all the waves are complete, the door is open and the player is freed, happy to live about their days, no better off than they were before they entered the room, but potentially with a little less health. If a player dies in the room, he gets respawned as normal, but the room will keep going until all the players in the room are no longer in the room. This stretched my ECS framework a little bit because it's kind of a complex encounter. I ended up structuring it like this. The entire room is managed by a single entity. It knows its boundaries so it can easily detect players and spawn monsters inside the room. Every stage of the encounter is managed by a list of events where the next event won't start until the current event is finished. Every entity that gets spawned by the room gets what I call a death link connection to the room entity. This is kind of a parent-child relationship where if the room dies then all the spawn entities will die as well. This helps me clean up all the spawn entities regardless of how or why they were created. Once the room encounter ends, the room destroys itself and respawns in the exact same location. Because it destroys itself, any and all death-linked entities will also get destroyed. That should hopefully close the loop and reset the room to its initial state. Next I wanted to add some sort of spatial lookup feature to my game. I knew it would help with improving collision detection performance, but I also wanted an easier way to look up which players were closest to which enemies. I decided for now to use spatial hashing, which is where we pack all of our colliders into separate buckets depending on which regions they overlap with. When we want to do collision detection, we first do a pass to check which regions our collider intersects. Then we do a second pass, where we check our collider against each collider in the region we found. Organizing it this way can greatly reduce the number of collision checks we have to execute, because we immediately skip regions which are too far away to cause any collisions. We can also eliminate more collision checks by using collision layers. This sort of adds another dimension to our spatial hash, where we also separate buckets based on the layer. If we know that colliders on different layers don't collide, then we can skip checking collisions across those layers. For example, in my game I know that monster projectiles will never hit another monster, so I'll never have to check the monster projectile layer against the monster layer. Because monsters spawn a ton of projectiles, this can reduce a ton of collision checks. To measure performance gains, I spawned 100 slimes and timed how long the collision system ran for. Each slime shoots 4 projectiles at a time, so there was a lot going on. Before, the system took about 11 milliseconds on average, with some spikes going all the way up to 20 milliseconds. After the change, it only took 1.5 milliseconds, so quite a bit of improvement, and definitely a step in the right direction. During testing, I started noticing weird frame stutter issues in Firefox. I didn't remember this being present in the past, but I wasn't sure, so I pulled and relaunched an old build, and sure enough it was there. Weirdly, sometimes when I relaunched the game, the frame setter issue would disappear, and when I tried to profile the game, the frame setter would go away causing the game to run smoothly again. I'd see my rendering code complete in less than 4 milliseconds, which is definitely fast enough. I was starting to think that there was some sort of weird Go garbage collection issue that maybe manifested itself only in the single-threaded WASM runtime of a browser, so I decided to optimize a bunch of my allocations, especially the ones in WebAssembly. This wasn't too hard, but it took a good amount of time. In most cases, it was just me fixing some lazily written code. Even as I reduced the allocation count considerably, the frame setter issue still wouldn't go away. So I read about how JavaScript event loops work, I ensured I was using the request animation frame correctly, I looked at a bit engine, a bit an engine, Ebit, Ebit engine to see how they handled WebGL, and admittedly ended up stealing a few optimization ideas from their code base. To be honest, I was completely baffled, and the fact that I couldn't profile it made solving the issue that much harder. Then it hit me. What if something's wrong with Firefox? So I found some random IO game, Zombs.io, and sure enough the problem was there too. I literally couldn't believe I spent so much time debugging an issue that ended up being a problem with my browser. Regrettably, in an attempt to fix this issue, I wrote in some half thought out fixes which probably did more harm than good, so I had to spend some time rolling those back. Luckily, a lot of the fixes were legitimate improvements, so I'll happily keep those in and slowly move towards a more optimized code base. One improvement was better iteration in my ECS library. Previously, I was only able to iterate over entities which had all of the required components. Now users will create queries into their ECS, specify which components they want access to, and optionally provide a set of filters which gives them tighter control over which entities they want. Then I added a with filter, which makes sure every entity also has this component. And I also added an optional filter, which include entities even if they don't have this component. Additionally, because Go doesn't have function overloading, I have to call my functions messy names like query1 and query2, and I also have to implement them separately. So I wrote a little code generation using the Go templating library, and generated all of my queries up to 12. Well, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed my pain and suffering this time around. I'll see you next time.